Hello and welcome. The city of Mumbai has been seeing increased cases of COVID-19, but more than that, some hospitals and doctors are reporting more cases of pregnant women and children. So how does that affect uh, the overall problem that we are facing as a city in terms of capacity to respond and to, of course, attend to these cases? And what is the treatment path that's being followed? Uh, to discuss that, I'm joined by uh, uh, both a pediatrician and an obstetrician and gynecologist. Uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Ravinder Chittal, consultant, pediatrician and neonatologist at Hinduja Healthcare and Nilavati Hospital in Mumbai, as well as Dr. Kiran Koelo, head of department, obstetrics and gynecologist also at Lilavati Hospital. Uh, thank you both for uh, joining me. Uh, uh, Dr. Koilo, let me uh, go with you first. So uh, what are the kind of cases that you've been seeing uh, amongst pregnant women in the last month or so, or even 40 days? And uh, have you been seeing any changes in the kind of cases that have been presented to you? Well, actually, of course, we know that the numbers are rising. But in my practice, so far, I haven't had any patient who is COVID positive. Uh, having said that, uh, due to uh, I practice at Kar Hinduja as well as Leelawati and Surya Hospital. Now the hospitals, uh, we have to do the COVID testing for all pregnant women within five days of their delivery. So normally after the 32nd week, I'm testing all my patients every 15 days because if they do, uh, they they have to uh, have a COVID negative test. Otherwise, they cannot be delivered in the hospital. And if they do come with uh, in, in an emergency without the COVID test, then we keep them in isolation, take care of them with complete protection, PPEs, until their COVID test um, results come. Now, if they are COVID negative, then we continue, of course, with the delivery. If they are COVID positive, then we send them to the hospitals, which are um, for, uh, did, uh, are the, you know, um, designated. Uh, suggested, yeah, dele delegated for deliveries for COVID positive patients. Now, the municipal one is Nair Hospital, and the private hospitals are Nanavati Hospital and uh, SL Raheja Hospital. These are the in two Mumbai. hospitals in Mumbai, yes. Right. So you're saying that you uh, come across COVID, COVID cases, uh, positive cases amongst pregnant women, but they're not with you or in your hospital? Yes. So far, I haven't had, but with the numbers, uh, we. Uh, Increasing, I'm sure we may get patients. So far, I haven't. Okay, and I'm going to come to you and ask you about how you're uh, dealing with them uh, or, or, or you're setting up to deal with them. Uh, Dr. Chidal, what's your experience been so far? Well, we have not had any COVID positive cases in the clinic. Of course, obviously, everybody's following the social distancing and, and the quarantine themselves by voluntary inside the house. The kind of class of people we get in Lilavati Hospital and Hinduja Hospital, of course, a more protected, kind of a gated community almost. And they are well protected. We have had cases staying in the distance who have been our patients in the past, like in Malar and Kandimli, who have tested positive because the parents came positive and the child has to be quarantined. So far, none of the children have had any bad outcome. They become negative after eventual quarantining and they don't have to get any medications. In fact, as of now, there is no protocol medicines for a COVID positive symptomatic or asymptomatic child. It's basically a symptomatic medicines. We do give azithromycin if there is a respiratory symptoms. We cannot give hydroxychloroquine in children below 15 years of age. So some people have tried sometimes with an adverse side effects and stuff like that. So we, are, we don't have a fixed protocol for children. If they have respiratory infection, treat with azithromycin, quarantine them, and manage respiratory infection till they recover out of the respiratory symptoms. Children have robust lungs, thankfully. They do not have the same bad outcome as adults with comorbidities. Though, children are known to pass the virus in the stools even. So they may be asymptomatic, but a COVID positive child is equally of danger to the surrounding environment because he keeps on shedding. Even neonate, neonates, there have been cases reported of deliveries, like Dr. Kiran said, we haven't had cases yet, They're not reported so far. But in UK, they have had pregnant women, COVID positive, symptomatic delivering babies, and they came COVID positive babies. Now, this is not during the delivery transmission. This is vertical transmission, but there are cesarean sections and babies came positive, of course, with a good outcome. But to the dismay, they found that these babies keep on passing the virus in the stools. So gut becomes a source of infection even in neonates. So you have to be very, very careful just because the child is robust, asymptomatic, survives, but he's a source of infection to everybody else in the house. So be very, very careful. Right. 
Right. So this, uh, when you talk about, you know, stools, and this was brought up by uh, some other doctors as well, uh, you know, it's essentially gastrointestinal uh, uh, symptoms. H how do you, uh, uh, you know, uh, gauge that in children? I'm sure many, many parents want to know because children are the ones who perhaps go out and play and even now uh, and they want to or they have to, particularly if they're young and uh, staying cooped up is a challenge. I tell you, this infection is something that we have never exposed to before. It's something different altogether. In fact, we keep on changing our parameters of diagnosis, treatment, everything. Because initially we said fever is mandatory for a COVID positive child or an adult. Now fever, you can have COVID positive without fever. You may have a respiratory symptoms, you may have not have respiratory symptoms. So they said we have to do a CT scan for so every person who's COVID positive, CT scan comes normal. Then we have a GI symptom. We have children with selectively GI symptoms, which have vomiting, severe abdominal pain, and COVID comes positive. We have children with tremendous amount of rashes on the bodies. We have children with the thromboembolic phenomenon, like blocking of the blood vessels, thrombotic phenomenon. So this is a mother of all bugs. It's behaving different in different situations. Depend maybe on the child's own immunity, maybe depends upon the, 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 the duration of the illness, but each one is so only a high index of suspicion that you can pick up a case of COVID positive just by history of sudden onset of any symptom could be COVID positive. Right, and, right. and I'm going to come back to that symptom uh, as well. So, uh, Dr. Koila, how are you gearing up to, uh, you know, for potentially more cases uh, of women who are pregnant? And also, in general, what are you telling your, uh, your current patients about how to take care and take the right precautions? Absolutely. As you can uh, well imagine, the pregnant patients are absolutely petrified. Now, with regard to the antenatal visits, I think in the first trimester, if they do um, just an ultrasound uh, at uh, the timing of, say, um, 11 to 13 weeks when we do the early anomaly scan, then they can schedule the visit with the obstetrician at that point of time. Thereafter, another scan at 20 weeks, at that point of time, they can schedule the visit with the obstetricians. And otherwise, all patients, I encourage them to do video consultation with their obstetrician so that they minimize the travel to the hospital. Un unless, of course, they have other mm -hmm. morbidities like diabetes and high blood pressure, et cetera, complicating pregnancy, then they have to see their obstetrician more frequently. Now, towards term, after the 32nd week, then we would like to video consult with the patient every week until they go into term and do a last sonography around 37, 38 weeks to ascertain uh, the condition of the baby. Now, we know since it's very evolving, there are studies, a study has just come out uh, last week where they studied 450 patient, uh, women, pregnant women and deliveries around the world. And they found that there was a direct transmission of almost 9%. And... Uh, premature labor, which was otherwise only at 13.5 preterm labor, is now 26% in the COVID positive patients. And there is direct tra transmission. So these are the uh, problems that pregnant women would face. So we, as I said, we do the COVID testing and uh, the precautions that they should take is the usual precautions. Isolation, very important. Hand washing, very important. Wearing a mask wherever they go out and proper hygiene as far as their cough and cold. Then what symptoms, of course, since they are, the, they are uh, during pregnancy, that's one of the reasons where we can uh, do a COVID test. Pregnant women are allowed. Otherwise, it's very difficult to do a test for non-pregnant women. But pregnant women, we give them a prescription and they can have the COVID uh, test, test testing right. done. Now, if uh, the general precautions are, of course, if they do, how, how, what are the symptoms? If they get flu-like symptoms, cold, cough, sore throat, then definitely they should have a COVID testing done. And isolation is so important, not going out in so for social gatherings, not going out of the house, um, you know, uh, keeping um, a safe distance from everyone in the house is very important. Now, right, how so, we are, uh, uh, yes, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, how we are gearing up is that we have all started, most of obstetricians have started video consultation with the patients. And I personally call up all my patients after the 32nd week every week. I call them up, ask them how they are doing, give them advice on diet, exercise, their medication, give them uh, tips on, uh, uh, you know, how to prevent uh, getting infected and then giving them advice of how, when they should come into uh, to hospital when they are in labor. 
Now, we have a triaging system outside the hospital where their fever is checked, uh, their, their temperature is checked, then their blood pressure, etc. Everything is tested. And of course, with a COVID negative uh, test only, they can actually deliver in the hospital. Now, another thing is very difficult for patients nowadays because, you know, when normally when a patient comes for delivery, they come with their mother, mother-in-law, husband, and a whole retinue of patients. But now, you see, they are so apprehensive because only one birth attendant will be allowed at the time of delivery. And uh, earlier, we were doing the COVID testing of the birth attendant as well. But now, because they don't recommend it, so we are allowing one birth attendant to be with the patient, whether they have a COVID uh, negative uh, test or not. But the patient itself, we do the COVID testing. Right. And, and broadly, in terms of uh, infrastructure, how are you placed? I mean, uh, bomb, uh, all Mumbai hospitals are filling up and uh, obviously that's putting a strain on other uh, facilities. So how are you placed in all the hospitals that you're working in? Yeah, I work in uh, Leelawati Hospital, Khar Hinduja and Surya Hospital. Uh, Leelawati Hospital does have an um, uh, isolation ward as well as a COVID uh, ward, but that is not for pregnant women. So for deliveries, we have to send them to the designated hospitals. We are not geared to do uh, conduct deliveries uh, for patients of COVID positive. They have, uh, the, uh, for, for various reasons, number one, they would have, uh, you know, we cannot mix the COVID negative right. with the COVID positive. We don't have a isolated labor room. We don't have dedicated isolated nurses. So we have to, and it is the government, um, uh, the new government directive also to send these uh, COVID positive pregnant patients to the designated hospitals. And and uh, I mean, uh, if there, since there is a surge in cases which continues right now, uh, are you are you worried that uh, it might start affecting more pregnant women? Because we're hearing it from uh, other hospitals as well, not just in Mumbai, but uh, right. to some extent in other parts of the country too. So uh, in in that case, uh, how how difficult does that make life for you? Yes, you, the numbers are increasing, but as I said, uh, for, in the so private far. hospitals, the patients are, you know, not exposed that much. They are all uh, maintaining their isolation. They are not going out in public. They wear masks and they're very particular. So the chances of them getting infected, at least in my uh, private uh, patient population, uh, I think is little less. It's the, the numbers are increasing in all the areas, unfortunately, where... Uh, isolation, staying at home is not possible. There are a whole lot of people in one room, etc. The chances of them getting infection is much more. Right. Uh, Dr. Chital, so uh, for children, uh, you said that, you know, the index of suspicion has to be very high and uh, uh, and therefore, and, and this is a very rapidly evolving disease and rapidly evolving symptoms. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, I, I was reading about the Kawasaki syndrome uh, in, in, in uh, as reported in the U.S., uh, just a couple of days ago where children are turning up with uh, inflammatory uh, shock syndromes. So, uh, you know, it's all inexplicable. It's difficult to pin down and understand. So what would you uh, recommend to parents at this point of time? You know, the, the tendency is also to read everything and maybe panic even more. So how do they go from here? Social media is helping, but it's also helping to a lot of panic. To some extent, having anxiety is good because it keeps the children inside the house to some extent. But, you know, it's very difficult to sustain that sustained you know, indoor activity for children. How much would they be? Children need to go out, and that becomes a challenge for the parents. They need to mix with the friend who's sitting next door, but you know, it's very, very challenging, but it's very important also that they do not intermingle. The second challenge we pediatricians face is the immunization. Because we need to complete certain immunization which are mandatory. For example, the primary vaccinations in the first year, the polio, DPT, hepatitis, HIV are mandatory. For some time, we are telling the parents to wait on. The six weeks vaccine can be delayed by two weeks more. The 14 weeks can be delayed by 10 weeks, up to 24 weeks. But then there's a mandatory now circulation, which, uh, circular which has come from even Johns Hopkins Institute, that the mandatory vaccinations, which are vaccinations below one year, have to be completed. So we have started vaccinating babies. But we have to have a triage. We cannot allow vaccination babies to mix with sick babies. We don't, in the clinic that I run, we don't see children with fever in the clinic. We have a fever scanner. If the child has a history of fever, he has to come with a COVID-19 negative report, only then he'll be allowed inside. We allow only one attendant with the child. 
we allow one patient at the gap of every 15 minutes. The child has to have, I mean, we have to have a hand sanitizer. Parents should have a mask. Child need not have a mask. And we have strictly following the social distancing. All the same, the risk of exposing the child coming out in a vehicle, maybe with the driver, we are not so sure the child will not that likely to be infected outside. So there's a real risk, but not vaccinating the baby who are so vulnerable for the primary vaccine, the so-called vaccine preventable diseases, we have to finish. What can be delayed are the boosters, the hepatitis A vaccine, the chickenpox vaccine, the boosters at 18 to 24 months, or even typhoid vaccine can be delayed. What cannot be delayed is polio, DPT, hepatitis C, and pneumococcal vaccine. We need to finish those at a risk. But then if you follow the trial just very strictly, we can allow this to happen. Right. So Every you're saying that parents, uh, this is something that parents should definitely do, uh, you know, even given the current situation where obviously venturing out is difficult. Correct. We have to do some kind of uh, exposure, limited exposure in a safe environment. Right. So last question to both of you, and let me start with you, uh, Dr. Chital. So what about, uh, you know, what about mental health? I mean, how are, uh, I mean, are you, are you, I know that's not your, uh, I mean, that's not what you're treating, but are you getting uh, reports of how ch maybe children are affected by this? And if so, what should parents be doing? And what is the next course of treatment, if any? And saying that, that's not my, believe me, I'm treating more mental illnesses than physical illness. Physical illnesses are surprisingly on the low. Because they are eating safe food, they have the safe environment inside the house. They're not going to school, they're not going to nursery, they're not in play school, they're not in daycare centers. So chances of transmitting infection is so less, they are relatively healthy at home. But they are confined to a place. Many children have started bedwetting. Many children are constantly at temper tantrum, going for the food, don't want to take medicines. They are just in temper tantrum. And parents are really at wit's end how to keep them their own sanity and the child's sanity. And it's going to be really challenging as the lockdown is extended more and more. I mean, to some extent, we are losing our sanity. We, we have stopped putting on the television. Sorry to say, tell you, but you stop putting on because you only get to know the increasing numbers, increase the shutdowns, and, and children are not immune to this. I can tell you, children are definitely affected by the anxiety that parents transmit to them, maybe. So, right, and, and that's a good point. I think parents should be uh, careful to sort of not be uh, anxious and therefore not, not their uh, anxiety. Are we are heading for. Right, right. Uh, Dr. Koyla, last word. Uh, I, I mean, are you dealing with uh, uh, over-anxious uh, patients and then and, and uh, how are you, uh, you know, counseling them or advising them? Absolutely. As it is during pregnancy, the, every woman is anxious, especially those who are having their first baby. And now it's magnified to a power of infinity because there are so many apprehensions, uh, you know, whether they will get the infection, whether they will be in isolation, whether they will, uh, you know, whether they will be allowed a birth attendant and whether, the, you know, they would be able to uh, manage whether they are going to have a C-section or a normal delivery. We prefer normal delivery, of course. And um, so during pregnancy also, they are not getting adequate exercise that they should. So there are a lot of online uh, prenatal exercises which are available, which I share with all my patients. So they can remain physically active uh, during the pregnancy and also be pre more prepared uh, to go. But uh, definitely anxiety levels. I have had patients with panic attacks. Uh, in my consulting room the other day, I had a patient who had come with 170, 120 blood pressure uh, out of sheer anxiety. And we had to admit her and, uh, you know, she was almost uh, about to get convulsion, something that we don't see normally in a regular uh, with patients with regular antenatal checkup. So definitely anxiety levels are tremendous. Yoga, pregnancy yoga, meditation, frequent consultation with the obstetrician and online uh, prenatal exercises are definitely recommended. Right. Uh, uh, Dr. Chitel and Dr. Coelho, thank you very much. And I, I wish you all the best in, the, in our continued fight against uh, this virus and COVID-19. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.